Here on Chalk Talk, we have talked a lot about isolated gate drivers over the last couple years. Their ability to help with short circuits and over voltage is especially important when it comes to EV charging, new advancements in energy storage, and solar technology. But what about galvanically isolated gate drivers? What do they bring to the party? I'm glad you asked. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. When it comes to higher power applications, galvanically isolated gate drivers can be a great solution for power modules and silicon carbide MOSFETs. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Emmanuel Enney from Infineon and I examine Infineon's Ice Driver F3 Enhanced Isolated Gate Driver family. We take a closer look at the advantages of galvanic isolation and the key features and benefits that this gate driver family can bring to your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Manuel. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Amelia. I'm more than happy to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about the Ice Driver F3 today. But before we dig into the details, what all will we be covering today? So today we're going to go a little bit about to over the F3 family and we're going to get a little bit of an overview. Afterwards, we're going to discuss the advantages of galvanic isolation. Then we're going to look into the DSET protection and have a little bit of deep dive to discuss, let's say, how this can be enhanced. Later on, we're going to discuss about key features of the F3 gate driver and what system advantages it brings to the table. And lastly, we're going to present what evaluation boards we have and what other support material we can provide. Excellent. So what kind of benefits are we looking at when it comes to the ICE driver F3? The ICE driver F3, so one of our newest gate drivers, it just got released at the beginning of this year. And it's an update of our existing F2 gate driver. This still is a very popular gate driver from Infineon. It's been on the market for a very long time. And we decided that it's time for an update. So what we did is we came up with a single channel gate driver and we bumped the current up to eight and a half amps. Uh, of course, the gate driver comes with a typical uh, enhanced features. So active Miller clamp is present. We have DSET and some products also have a soft off feature. We tried to update our old F2. So right now we went uh, and we worked on the propagation delay and we came up with a 35 nanosecond propagation delay. And here what I want to highlight is this includes a 35 nanosecond input filter. Basically, what this means is in the end, the customer doesn't need to put in an input filter, an RC filter, and uh, this saves some space on the bill of materials. And at the same time, he gets a filter behavior, which is very, very um, linear. You see here at the bottom side where we were mentioning sick is we worked on the part to part matching. And here we managed to get it in the plus minus 15 nanoseconds, which means this part is really uh, suited for paralleling. We have a typical DSO 16 300 millimeter package. It's an eight millimeter creepage distance uh, and the standard uh, 1.27 millimeter pitch. And what's here we, we try to work on is to make sure it's still compatible with the old products from Infineon. So there's a lot of second source for the users. And here on the right side, you can actually see the two different pinouts. So we have a part which keeps the old pinout uh, the one on the top where it says out and NC. So the original part came with a not connected pin and a single output. But for modern applications, we want to be give the customer the opportunity to have to control both sync and source. So this is why we, because the package allowed, we now have sync and source uh, capabilities. Of course, it comes with all the bells and whistles for in terms of certification. So we have UL1577 certification for 5.7 kilovolt RMS. And we have the reinforced isolation certification from VDE uh, 0884-11. It's rated for 1.7 kilovolts. And this is actually quite special because it certifies a lifetime of 37.5 years for the isolation. If reinforced isolation is not needed, we say we can drive any type of uh, power switch up to 2.3 kilovolts. 
So from us, let's say the value proposition comes from the modern behavior. It's a really strong gate driver. So a lot of times that the user doesn't need to buffer anymore. At the same time, you get 40 volt output power supply. This means you can have a lot of extra room for ringing or overshooting your gate circuit. So you don't need to be extra cautious for the margins. So Emmanuel, we have talked a lot about isolated gate drivers over the years here on Chalk Talk, but I don't think we have ever specifically talked about galvanically isolated gate drivers. So what makes these kind of gate drivers special and why should we use them? Generally, let's say what you're getting from a galvanically isolated gate driver is the capability to have independent power supplies. So you have your low voltage domain, you say your microcontroller domain, which is can be a 3.3 volt domain. And that one is galvanically, is completely separated from your high voltage domain, so from your power switch domain. So this basically gives you endless possibilities in terms of supply voltages. So you can do negative turn-offs, you can do high voltage turn-ons and so on. So this is really a nice feature coming from such a gate driver. At the same time, it also provides a safe isolation barrier. So you have a lot of applications in case of, God forbid, a failure at the high voltage side, you have a risk that the high voltage, let's say you're switching one kilovolt, will propagate to the microcontroller. So instead of the fault remaining on the high voltage domain, it comes into the low voltage domain. And this is even worse, for example, if you have applications that actually require reinforced isolation because you have a human interface machine where a user can touch it. So you want to avoid this because, of course, electric shocks is a big no-no. Another really, let's say, a big advantage is it cuts the ground loops. So all the DIDT, especially when you have fast switching applications, when you have a lot of current in your application, this will create some ground shifts and with the galvanic isolated gate driver, you can separate the microcontroller. So the microcontroller stays on its low voltage domain and operates undisturbed by the fast switching events. So the ground loops are completely cut. And of course, the last clear advantage is that you have zero level shift losses. We really use the galvanic coilless transformer to communicate. So there's no level shift losses. We can really push the switching frequency very high in the applications. Okay, so Emmanuel, isolation is also an important aspect to consider here, right? Yeah, this is correct. And uh, for us, let's say we have two different aspects of what uh, we, when we talk about isolation. So we have, let's say, the functional isolation and what we call uh, reinforced isolation. So when we're talking about the functional isolation, we mean you have an isolation barrier that basically offers all the advantages I mentioned earlier, independent supplies, uh, ground shift immunity, and a safe isolation barrier. Now, if you want to go one step above, you will have an isolation which we refer sometimes as UL1577 uh, certification. So this comes with an uh, overvoltage certificate from UL that the part can withstand a 5.7 kilovolt RMS uh, pulse. Uh, and this we have for the F3. And uh, what we consider the highest level of certification for such a part, this is the reinforced isolation certification, comes from uh, VDE 0884-11 certificate. And it uh, basically uh, certifies the isolation lifetime of 37.5 years for the gate driver for as long as described. Okay, so Emmanuel, can you explain a bit about how functional and reinforced isolation comes into play, especially when it comes to the ICE driver F3? So you have applications where you might need uh, reinforced isolation or you have applications that you need only functional. So for example, if you need functional isolation, you have an application such as solar uh, inverters or you have a secondary isolation barrier somewhere else and you're happy for the gate driver to only provide functional isolation, you can use the ICE driver F3 which switches up to 2.3 kilovolts. And this is also stated in the data sheet. Now, on the other hand, if you have a requirement from the gate driver to have reinforced isolation, and this is quite typical for drives application, so for motor drives or general purpose drives, here uh, you can use the ICE driver F3 uh, for switches uh, that have a voltage class up to 1.7 kilovolts. 
Okay, so let's talk about short circuit detection. How does the ICE driver F3 DSAT circuit help me here? The DSAT circuit has been well-known uh, short circuit protection, and this was uh, designed initially to take advantage of the IGBTs. If we look initially at the causes for short circuit, you have internal causes like inadequate design or component degradation, and then you can have external effects like system overload, mechanical damage. I've even seen uh, technicians dropping the spanner on the output uh, terminals, so you can get a lot of things. And here on the right, you can see the typical circuit for the ICE driver F3, and you can see highlighted with the berry color the DSAT circuit. So it's a simple and time-proven circuit. It uses a capacitor, a resistor, and a diode. And through this one, we can measure the desaturation of the IGBT and then protect. Here on the left side, you can see the normal operation first. So you turn on and off and everything is going well. But at a certain point, let's say during your own or as you turn on, you might get a short circuit event. Generally, what happens is for an IGBT, your current will start increasing. And typically it increases by three to five times the nominal current. And of course, your VCE will also increase. And as you turn on, you'll get an overshoot. For silicon carbide, actually, the increase can be anywhere from five to 10 times the nominal current. So it's even worse for silicon carbide. But this is a typical, let's say, waveform for short circuit. And hopefully, in a very fast time, within the withstand time of the switch, the DSAT circuit detects fits and protects and also signals the faults to the microcontroller. We really like the DSAT circuit because it provides reliable and accurate short circuit protection. And we think that the ICE driver F3 brings a lot of system level protection and actually ensures a high system uptime and enhances the safety of your application. So it can complement your overcurrent protection based on a shunt measurement or a whole effect measurement. So a hot topic these days seems to be the use of silicon carbide MOSFETs. So how would ICE driver F3 protect silicon carbide MOSFETs? When we design our uh, F3, we really designed it with uh, silicon carbide also in mind. So we tried to pay attention to silicon carbide. And as you know, Infineon has a uh, great silicon carbide. We tailored our gate drive so to make sure it works also well for the cool sick. If you look at a cool sick, you generally can handle a transient on the gate anywhere between minus 10 and 23 volts. Generally, we recommend a turn on voltage anywhere between 15 and 18 volts and a turn of voltage zero volts can be used for most applications. And if necessary, we can even go down to minus two volts because of the technology. Now we have these two voltages, 18 and 15. For 18 volts, this provides a lower RDS on for the silicon carbide switch for the cool sick, but generally comes with no short circuit capability. Uh, now, if the application requires short circuit, then the user has to use a 15 volt gate voltage for the turn on. And this one comes with the short circuit capability. Generally, it's up to three microseconds for the discrete cool seek and up to two microseconds for the modules. And because of how Infineon designs the cool seek or the silicon carbide MOSFETs, we generally have a higher threshold voltage, typically in the four and a half volt range. And the coupling between the capacitances is done in such a way that zero volts can be used for most applications and you don't really need a negative voltage. And this is really uh, important also for the switch. Okay, so Emmanuel, can you go into a bit more detail about the DSAT circuit? Of course. So uh, what you see here is uh, on the left side, you see the typical uh, DSAT circuit that we have implemented in our uh, ICE driver F3. And uh, here with the purple uh, berry, we show the typical current path when we don't have a desaturation event. And here on the lower graph, let's say we can go slowly and explain everything. So in the beginning, let's say this will be your typical VCE. So as you turn on, your VCE will start uh, going down towards the VCE set typical value. And built into the gate driver, you see here we have a comparator with a reference value. Uh, generally, and for this product, it's nine volts. So for the first part of the turning on, we have a leading edge blanking time. And this is in order to allow for the IGBT to properly turn on. So for the voltage to start decreasing, we have a leading edge blanking time. It's this MOSFET you see here with the from digital core marking. And we keep the DSAT pin to zero 
for a specific amount of time. In this case, it's 400 nanoseconds. So after 400 nanoseconds, we release it and you see here the yellow line, the voltage starts increasing. And this is typical for the voltage at the D set pin. Of course, if you have a short circuit and your RGBT goes into the saturation, your voltage starts increasing and it will not stop to follow the VCE. It will just continue until it reaches the trigger point. But if everything works well, it actually follows the shape of the yellow line. So it sits just above the VCE. You have some uh, voltage drop in the sense path. And this is generally given by this equation you see here. So it's current, which in our case is 500 microamps times RD set, plus the forward voltage drop in the diode, in the D set diode, plus whatever collector emitter uh, voltage the IGBT has during normal operation. What people do to adjust the response time is generally play with the D set capacitor and at the same time the D set resistor. So the D set capacitor gives you the time constant uh, until you charge this capacitor to the trigger point and the D set resistor gives you the voltage drop. So it somehow sets the voltage. Okay, so Emmanuel, what does the measurement setup look like? Here you can see the measurement setup we used, and we actually wanted to show the capability of the ICE driver uh, F3 short circuit protection using D set. So we used one of the evaluation boards we have, the Eval 1ED3321 MC12N, to do the measurements. Here you see a bit more detailed image. So we use the gate driver that has a 230 milliamp soft off turnoff. So this will be reflected in the response time of the turnoff. So it will be a bit slower because we're using the soft off. That basically limits the overshoot. For the D set measurement, to get a really good precise, we used an optically isolated probe. Uh, we're using isolated differential probes for the gate emitter and collector emitter voltages, and we're using a Rogowski coil for the collector current. And we did some more measurements. So we did some 600 volt measurements and 100 volt measurements. Excellent. So, Emmanuel, can you walk us through what a typical short circuit would look like here? Sure. Here you see a, a typical type 1 short circuit uh, with an IGBT and uh, let's say the IS driver F3 protecting it. So what we actually did here is we shorted the high side of the half bridge and we turned on the low side IGBT. And what you see here at time zero, the gate starts increasing. And if you look at the D set voltage, so the second graph, you see that for the first 400 nanoseconds, uh, the D set pin stays low. This is the leading edge blanking time that has the clamp on and keeps the D set pin to zero. But as soon as the leading edge blanking time elapses, the current starts flowing out of the D set pin and starts charging our D set capacitor. Uh, you can see the typical waveform of uh, in the collector emitter that IGBT went into short circuit, and you can see also the current went almost to 150 amps. Now, once the D set voltage hits nine volts, the internal protection starts triggering. So it triggers a turn off. And from here, you see the, basically the current reaches zero, roughly at 1.5 microseconds. So we're protecting our IGBT in more or less 1.5 microseconds. Now bear in mind, the short circuit with stand time for an IGBT, it's generally up to 10 microseconds. So 1.5 microseconds is actually quite fast. So, Emmanuel, you just showed a fast DSAT for IGBTs, but what can we do if we want even faster DSAT protection for silicon carbide MOSFETs? We did this uh, gate driver with silicon carbide also in mind. IGBTs are a huge part of the market, but silicon carbide is really the hottest trend, and we really want to offer protection, and we think DSAT is a good protection. So, let's say if 1.5 microseconds, it's not enough for your application, although we showed that CoolSick can actually live with such a protection time, we can enhance the protection circuit. So if you remember the previous circuit that you see right here, we can do what I call an overdrive circuit. What you do, you can actually go ahead and remove the DSET capacitor. Personally, I'm not a big fan of removing the DSET capacitor, so I like to have their DSET capacitor because otherwise you're relying only on the parasitic capacitance and that's never good because depending on your layout, it might change. Another thing you can do is you can add an overdrive circuit. So you see here R1 and D1, we added it between the output of the gate driver, so the point between RD set and DD set. What this one does, if you notice in the bottom, it basically made the slope 
the made the charging current higher and basically the trigger point is reached faster. Another way to do it is to take uh, R1D1 and move it uh, right in between the DSAT pin and RD set. In this case, we still have a higher current, but at the same time, we're also increasing the voltage drop. We're creating a voltage divider between R1 and uh, RD set. So the steady state voltage at the D set pin, it's a bit higher. So this means we have a faster protection time while still keeping quite reasonable CD set value. So how would the waveforms for a type one short circuit look like with such a circuit? We went ahead and we tried to see what we can easily obtain as a fast short circuit uh, for the type one. And this is what you're seeing here. In the end, you see here on the right what values you use. So we increased a little bit the DSET uh, resistor and we also put R1 to 2 kilo ohms. Of course, you can play a little bit more with these values to tune it to whatever uh, uh, you might like. Type 1 short circuit means you're turning on and the high side is already shorted. So you're turning on into a short circuit and you see here the gate voltage goes up. The D set is again held for the first 400 nanoseconds to zero and then it's released. So the capacitor starts charging and you see in this D set voltage the typical charging shape of a capacitor. And of course, as soon as it hits 9 volts, the protection circuit starts kicking in to turn off. The voltage will increase because there's nothing stopping it up to the VCC2 value, but this has no impact. And uh, what you notice here is that in, let's say, less than 1.1 microsecond, we managed to turn off the short circuit, which is really good because if you remember, we give somewhere for anywhere up to two or three microseconds as a short circuit with stand time capability for our cool seek. And of course, here we're limited by the leading edge blanking time. So, Emmanuel, Will the type two look any different? Yeah, actually, uh, the type two is a little bit faster than the type one. So let's first look over the waveform. So you see here again, at time zero, we turn on our gate. And then after 400 nanoseconds, the leading edge blanking time is elapsing. So you see here the VD set starts increasing. And at one microsecond, where you see the green line, we actually turn on the high side to trigger a type 2 short circuit. So the, the switch is already on and we're triggering a short circuit. And then you see here from the one uh, microsecond mark until the current goes to zero, we roughly 500 nanoseconds elapse. So for the type 2, we're actually much more faster because we don't have the leading edge blanking time slowing us down. And at the same time, with the overdrive circuit I showed you, the DC voltage now sits around uh, six to six and a half volts. So we're much faster to protect. So in this case, we did a 500 nanosecond protection, which is, I think, quite fast for any silicon carbide and for our cool sick. Okay, so can we also talk about common mode transients as well? I know they can cause problems down the line. CMTI and or common mode transient immunity was one topic we really worked on, on the ICE driver F3, and we tried to bring it up to speed. Uh, this is really important, especially when you're talking about silicon carbide, because everyone knows silicon carbide switches quite fast. So let's say a correct gate driver behavior is you have a PWM in coming from your microcontroller or a PWM generator, and basically the output follows this. But when once your power switch starts switching, it generates dv by dt. In reality, any type of isolation, including the gate driver, will have some parasitic capacitance between the input and output. And this dv dt can couple to this capacitance and cause interferences in the gate driver or in the PWM uh, circuit. Common mode transients will create malfunctions if the part is not robust enough. And of course, CMT becomes much more severe the, in high DVDT applications. So here we're talking silicon carbide, we're talking EV charging, we're talking solar. So can you give us some examples? Uh, of course. So if you look here, talking about uh, common mode transients, we have here on the right side uh, four examples of different operation possibilities. So in the first case, you have a PWM in, and because of the common mode transient, your output is not reacting, so you're missing the output. Uh, this is not really a desired behavior because in the end, you're not turning on that IGBT, so the output of your application, of your converter is distorted. And you don't want this because it generates harmonics, losses, and a lot of headaches. The second one is because of the DVDT, your gate driver, for some reason, will think 
the communication will get perturbed. So your PWM output will turn off briefly and then it will turn on. What this means is that your switch will not be properly turned on. So it will be, let's say, somewhere in between half turned on. So it's quite high ohmic and this will generate a lot of losses. If this happens in the long term, your switch will degrade faster because it will run harder. So it will degrade faster and it will shorten the lifetime. So you really don't want this either. Now, the third case, this is what we call the correct PWM. So whatever goes in comes out. So the output follows perfectly the input. And this is the ideal case. And we save the worst for last. What you see here is because of the high dV by dt, you don't have any PWM inputs. So your input is held low. But because of the CMT, your output turns on. So you have a false PWM on the output. What this means is your switch on when it should be off. Most likely, this will lead to a short circuit in one of your legs in the application. So this is really the most undesirable case. Basically, CMT causes can cause malfunctions. And CMTI is a definition of how resilient the gate driver is against CMT. So the higher the CMTI value, the more resilient the CMT is. For the ICE driver F3, we actually managed to achieve 300 kilovolts per microsecond in the CMTI value. So, Emmanuel, what about propagation delay matching? Can we talk about that aspect as well? So I'm really glad you asked this because generally propagation delay matching is actually one parameter which is quite misunderstood by users and by engineers. And I'll be honest, I also had this in my beginning. So when I started as an engineer, I was always looking at the propagation delay but never actually understanding that propagation delay is just a delay in the control loop, which you can calculate and account for it. But matching, part-to-part uh, -part matching variation is much more important. And let me let me get into this. So what you see here, for example, is your high side and low side PWM inputs at the top. And with the bear, you see the gate driver behaviors. So in an ideal case, only one switch is on. There's no overlap between the high side and the low side turn-ons. And you have a delay, what you see here, but as soon as you turn off the PWM for the low side, you turn on the PWM for the high side, and your gear drivers follow perfectly. In reality, if you look at the bottom side, you will always have a little bit of variation in the propagation delay. So what you risk happening is having the low side gear driver output going low, and before it reaches zero, the turn off voltage, the high side already starts turning on. So you will have a short period where actually both switches will be on. And this is actually a real life application. And in this case, you can get a shoot through. And of course, your system gets destroyed in the worst case. Best case scenario, your overlap is quite small, but you will still have a stress over your switches because they will overheat. Now, if we're talking about uh, yeah, propagation delay, what users do is they insert uh, dead time. So you insert a dead time to account for this period where both switches can be on in order to make sure that both switches are off. So you have this clear transition where the low side, let's say, gate driver output goes to the turn off voltage and then the high side only starts turning on. And um, this is a workaround found and accepted in the industry, but ideally this dead time should be as short as possible. Generally during the dead time, you have current flowing through the body diode. And of course, uh, you want your body diode to conduct as little as possible, especially again, we're going back to silicon carbide. The body diode is not really optimized for conduction. So you really want the body diode on only for the dead time. So you want to minimize the dead time as much as possible because you want to be able to switch as fast as possible. And the longer the dead time, the higher can be the EMI and the lower can be the efficiency. So uh, the dead time has an impact on the EMI and the efficiency of your application. If I would draw some conclusions for this, so that time really avoids shoot through, but decreases the system uh, overall efficiency and uh, increases the EMI. Part to part matching is critical for your application and basically it increases your efficiency. So this is why for the ICE driver F3, we worked a lot on the part-to-part -part matching. So we managed to get it within uh, plus minus 15 nanoseconds. 
So Emmanuel, if my audience wants to use the Ice Driver F3 in their next design, where should they start? Yeah, so I'm really happy the audience uh, got convinced uh, of the possibilities of the Ice Driver F3. Uh, we have a really great evaluation board design as a half bridge configuration. We aim to design all of our uh, evaluation boards as a half bridge so the user can get some better advantages. You don't get only to see how the gate driver behaves, let's say uh, what we put it in the data sheet in terms of propagation delay, but you really can put a switch in the evaluation board and you can see how it switches in a half bridge or a double pulse tester. And actually for this board, it even comes populated with LGBT, so it's really simple to get started. We have um, application notes available for the board. We have user guides. So there's really a lot of materials on our website to get started with this uh, product. Excellent. Now, what kind of supporting material do you guys have for the Ice Driver F3 if my audience wants more information? What we do have right now is we have an amazing uh, product page with the data sheet, application note, user guide, and we really address a lot of the terms. Um, we have simulation models, we have PCB design data, we even have the evaluation board design data so user can just go in and see how we routed, what parts we used, and so more. We even have a, now a community forum where if you have any questions or any uncertainties, you can go online and uh, just post your questions. Excellent. Okay, so Emmanuel, can you recap your main points for me? Sure. If I have to summarize, I would say the ICE driver F3 is what we call a multi-purpose gate driver. So we took the F2, we updated it, and we made a gate driver that works in a lot of diverse applications from uh, drives to EV chargers and can drive anything from IGBT to silicon carbide. It still has a versatile short circuit protection that works really well for silicon carbide and cool sick. We worked really hard and we have accurate timing and uh, very good output current capabilities. It's compatible with uh, switches up to 2.3 kilovolts and it has all the latest certifications such as uh, UL1577 and VD0884-11. Excellent. Well, Emmanuel, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, anything from your audience in terms of uh, using the Ice Driver F3. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.